And we're live. Welcome back, everyone, to a new episode of the Wheelie Podcast. I'm your host, Micah Toll, and I'm joined again by Electrex Seth Weintraub. How's it going, Seth? I'm good. Awesome. So we've got a pile of stories this week. About half of them, I would say, are electric bike uh, related. And then we've got some other interesting stories with um, some standing ATVs. Um, we've got a three-wheeled police trike, all sorts of interesting electric uh, two wheelers, three wheelers, and other types of vehicles. Uh, what are we starting off here with this week, Seth? All right. Uh, first story is say what? Walmart has a full suspension mid drive electric bike now. Okay. So let's see. Walmart's, uh, uh, so this is a Kent branded bike. This is a really interesting one because um, Walmart, their, their e bikes have always been. Uh, how do you say entry level, you know, not the highest quality of bikes, but um, this is the first time we've seen them come out with both a mid drive electric bike and a full suspension bike. So I wouldn't call this a, uh, a real mountain bike per se, but it, it's sort of a trail bike, you know, it's got some cheap front and rear suspension, but that mid drive motor is really interesting because it lets, uh, it lets people really have that experience of shifting through their motor, of better hill climbing performance, that sort of thing. Something that we've, we've never really seen before on a Walmart bike because they've always gone with hub motors. Um, but uh, from what I understand from, from Seth, this isn't really Walmart's first uh, stab at, at higher quality bikes, right, Seth? Uh, yeah, so one of the uh, kids of the Walmart founder, Sam Walton, I can't remember his name, but his last name is Walton, uh, is a bike nerd. And uh, he started a company called Viathlon. Actually, maybe I'll look it up here. And I know that you can see um, some Viathlon. They don't even have their... We're going to another site. But um, let me see if I can go to viathlon.com. They, ha <clears throat> they have high-end uh, acoustic bikes. Um, nope, not... Not there either. Uh, they need to work on their uh, domain uh, and their, their SEO, but um, oh wait, here we go, biathlon bicycles. Okay. So um, they have road bikes, uh, gravel bikes, and mountain bikes, and they're, they're solid, um, really good parts. They're you know, actually quite expensive. Um, so you, know, you look at four, five, six thousand dollar $6,000 bikes. So Walmart's not totally out of the nice bike game. But, um, you know, typically you go into Walmart, you expect to see a couple. And I can't remember, is this Hyper or you said, is it Kent or it looks like Hyper? So I there. believe it's, it's owned by Kent, um, but oh, okay. Hyper is the, the e-bike brand. Yeah. Okay. And these are seemingly exclusive to Walmart. Um, what, what kind of, I mean, I, I can't imagine they're super high-end components, but what do we, I saw Shimano. Uh, what else we got yeah, here? So it looks like. A uh, Shimano shifter. Uh, I don't believe those are branded brakes. I think they're they're either five star or just no name brakes. Uh, I didn't see a brand on the suspension and the motors mystery. So it's a lot of either non branded or sort of like white labeled OEM components. Right. So uh, we don't have a review unit of this yet. If uh, anybody at the uh, the Walmart factories uh, wants to get us one, that'd be fantastic. But um, it looks like this is going to be kind of base, very like value focused. Um, and what is the go? What is the price on this? Fourteen ninety eight. Fifteen hundred bucks. Yeah. yeah. Well, not bad for a full suspension uh, mid drive, um, and it's Shimano equipped, according to the uh, side of the bike. Um, yeah, I think that's your Shimano shifter there. Yeah, I I can't imagine it's going to be uh, a great experience, but. For those uh, looking for road and gravel and a solid, you know, larger mountain bike kind of tires, might make sense. Yeah, and I mean, it gets your foot in the door. You know, the difference between a mid-drive and a hub motor is quite different feeling. And for a lot of people that are, are on a hub motor budget, which is pretty much 1500 bucks or below, mm -hmm. you'd never really be able to get that mid-drive experience, especially not on a full suspension mountain bike, maybe on like a city bike where the other parts have been really downgraded. So to be able to get someone's foot in the door with a mid drive experience is, is pretty neat, even though you might be giving up some, some parts quality along the way. 
Yeah. I mean, it doesn't look like horrible parts. It looks like, you know, I, w I wouldn't put it in the like uh, anterior type of thing. But yeah, agreed. <laughs> somewhere, somewhere in the middle there. Oh, we'll have to check it out. Maybe I'll visit a Walmart and go go ride around the store a little bit. All right, uh, moving on. Harley Davidson Serial One unveils new electric mountain bike this time with suspension. Yeah. So if you've been following Harley Davidson's e-bike brand Serial One, you might know that a few weeks ago they released their first mountain bike, which was, I would say, almost more of a trail bike. It was a fully rigid bike, so a hardtail and a rigid fork. And um, this new electric mountain bike they've unveiled is the first bike that they've offered with front suspension. So it's got a pretty nice sun tour fork and some other big changes, though. If you look at the bike, you can see there's a lot of parts here that look pretty similar. So yep. compared to Serial One's street lineup of bikes, You'll see the frame looks basically identical. It's got that same Broza S-Mag motor. It's got the same 529 watt hour removable battery, which uh, that battery was partially designed by Harley's Livewire motorcycle engineers. So it's actually a pretty, pretty high end battery and uh, pretty impressive. You know, they didn't just like um, shop that out to some white labeled battery factory somewhere. So a lot of the same, um, you know, drivetrain components, or at least on the electric side that we have in the urban bikes. But when we move over into what's different, pretty much everything else here is updated. So we've got a, uh, a whole new drivetrain. Gone is that um, Enviolo automatic shifting uh, CVT. Instead, hey, we've got the 12-speed setup. Um, we've got a uh, new, ma uh, not Max, I think those are Michelin tires, actually. We've got a dropper seat post. So anyone who wants to you know, adjust your seat on the fly, especially when you're doing really rugged terrain or you're going downhill and you want to be able to stand up on the pedals and just have the seat drop out of the way. You know, one push with your thumb, you can lower the seat and then raise it back up when when you're ready for it. Um, so there's, you know, a lot of a lot of nice parts here, especially considering the price is pretty reasonable at 4,500 bucks. And with Serial One, you know, the, the price is going to be higher. You're partially paying for the name, but you, you are getting a lot of, of really nice design here and some pretty good parts as well. You know, I'm sure the, the drivetrain could have been upgraded a little higher. I think it's got, um, I think SRAM Eagle, um, uh, uh, I think it's a SRAM Eagle drivetrain there, but uh, I'll have to double check on that. But these are, you know, much nicer parts than you'd find on any mid-level electric mountain bike. So they are trying to compete with some of these European models, even if this is still a hardtail, you know, this is not obviously a full suspension mountain bike, but again, you know, um, light years away from the Walmart <laughs> bike that we just looked at. So in a different category. Yeah. And, and it looks like maybe those brakes are bigger. Those look like, weren't they 180s on the last ones? And these look like, yeah, good call. They're, um, they're both bigger in terms of diameter. They're 203s uh -huh. and they're thicker. So I think they're 2.3 millimeters thick, which is like a lot of metal going between those uh, brake pads. So it's going to take a long time to overheat those discs, especially that big. That's great. And then, um, you know, I kind of think of uh, Rosa uh, mountain bikes, I think of specialized typically. Um, and, you know, they have like the Turbo Vader, Vado, um, and those kind of things is i mean obviously uh serial one has the lower battery which probably helps for uh, mountain biking how else do these like compare to each other yeah so um definitely that that battery is gonna be much lower um this is the s mag motor and i'm not sure i think i'm not sure specialized is using a lighter version um i know on some of their bikes they've switched to even their own in-house right. motor that's designed like the the broza motor so um, to be honest, I, I'm not entirely sure. I haven't been on specialized mountain bikes uh, or their turbo mountain bikes. I've been on their um, road and like leisure bikes. Okay. So um, I'm not sure if they've got the same bros uh, S-Mag motor that, that we have here. It's interesting, though, because you typically think of Serial One as like the highest end. And I'm sure yeah, at $4,500, this is a lot less expensive than the specialized equivalent. Although, you know, that might be full suspension or whatever. Yeah, well, I would say that you know, this is Serial One's first stab at a mountain bike, and I think they did a great job. But when you compare them to companies like Specialized or Trek or some of these others that have had literally decades of experience building mountain bikes and then now have had 
nearly a decade of experience with electric bikes. There's there's probably a bit of catching up to do, but for a what like two year old brand, I think right. Serial One has really knocked it out of the park. Yeah, and they do have some you know uh, lineage, I guess I would say, uh, from the the Harley folks. Um, they, for sure. I don't know if they, they do too much off road, but um. All right, let's move on here. Uh, let's talk about uh, Urban Arrow's new family electric cargo bike. Is it the luxury SUV of the e-bike world? So I'm going to warn you going into this that this is a uh, $8,000 electric cargo bike. So uh, keep that in mind. There, it's a very expensive bike, but it's a pretty nice one as well. This is a front loader, which if you're listening and not looking to the pictures, it's that kind of cargo bike where you've got the big bucket in front, almost like a trough, and the front wheel is stretched way far out in front. So that that already makes these bikes much more expensive than uh, like a typical long tail cargo bike, something like a rad wagon that would have a, a stretched out rear of the bike, because it means that you've got to create a new steering geometry. You have to have a steering tube. Your handlebars are no longer connected um, right to the uh, fork. It's got all this mm -hmm. linkage. So it's much more you know, complicated bike to design. So it's going to be more expensive. But $8,000 is, that's a pretty penny. Right. But, uh, you, you do, I would say, get a lot for this. Now, uh, Urban Arrow, they're a British company. you know, So they do things the European way. Um, it's not always the cheapest way. But they build a very nice bike here. And it's really designed to be one of these car replacing bikes. It's from their, their family cargo line. And that should give you an idea. Like It's meant to put multiple kids in there, bring them to school, get a week's worth of groceries, that kind of thing. Uh, it's based on a Bosch Gen 4 motor. So it puts out 85 Newton meters of torque. They'll say it's 250 watts, but you know, <laughs> at this point, we, we all know that you're not pushing a bike that big with like three kids in it with 250 watts of power. So it's, it's 85 yeah, Newton meters of torque. The Europeans really need to do something about that. It's, uh, it's out of control. Yeah, this whole like wink, wink, 250 watt thing. I mean, until they change the laws and, and let you have more than 250 watts like uh, you'll find in the US. It's just going to be this this wink, wink game. But uh, I mean, that's why they give us the torque always, because that's the number that we can really gauge these motors by. So 85 Newton meters of torque is is way up there. You know, I think um, 90 or so is probably about the limit of most of these European mid drive motors. Um, we occasionally see a little bit higher, but you got to get into those Chinese motors before you see something like, you know, 100, 120 Newton meters, but those motors don't play by the same rules. So we've got, you know, a very powerful cargo uh, based motor from Bosch here. It's paired with their 500 watt hour battery, which uh, is not gigantic. It's small but this is not that. a, yeah, it's, it's on the smaller side, but keep in mind, there's no throttle here, right? So right. it's going to last longer. Right. Yeah, I guess once um, you get it going, it's it's going. You got the momentum. Just yeah, hopefully there's not Newton's on your side. Right. Uh, hopefully you don't have a lot of hills in your commute. All right, moving yeah. forward. Uh, REI, great, great company, uh, is launching two new electric bike models for a new generation of riders. And this bike seems familiar, but at the same time, I don't think I've seen it before. Yeah. So um, if you're if you're looking at this, you might see what looks like a mashup of a couple different bikes. This is a 20 inch wheel based utility bike on the rear. It's got a, a frame integrated rack. So the rack is really part of the frame, essentially. And it's got almost a rad runner look to it from like a rad power bikes rad runner. But at mm -hmm. the same time, the frame is it's a little Van Moofian, in my opinion, as well. It's got that oh. kind of like. Um, futuristic crossbar design and so yeah, like i can see a little a bit line. of both here uh, exactly yeah, yeah i didn't make that so, connection uh, initially um but i definitely like the back side definitely feels like uh rad runner inspired um but it looks like it works like it it's something that uh you know the 20 inch tire bikes are are the rage these days um and i, I think I don't know if REI had anything like this. So that's probably going to be a pretty, pretty big seller, I would imagine. Yeah, definitely. I mean, they were just doing urban bikes before. So while this is an urban bike, it's not like a, you know, pedal around the city to work kind of thing. This is more like a utility, um, put a kid seat on back, carry groceries, something that's much smaller than like that urban arrow we saw, but that can still be used for 
uh, some light cargo duty. Now it's a little bit lower power. Uh, there's two versions. There's the Generation E 1.1 and the Generation E 1.2. The first has a 36 volt battery. The second has a 48. So the 48 mm. volt one is going to be a bit more powerful, but they both come with a claimed 350 watt Bafang hub motor. So these are not, you know, like high power bikes, but for, you know, the, the average rider that's going to put in some good pedaling power, which by the way, I should mention they're also class one. So you will be pedaling. Um, you know, you're going to be able to help that 350 watts. And if you put in your own 100, 150 or so, you'll be at a, a pretty modest 500 watts there. And this is uh, cadence or torque sensing or both? or um, I believe this is cadence sensing. I didn't see anything about a, a torque sensor here. Okay. That'll be interesting, especially if you don't have a throttle. Um, it'll be interesting to see how good that, that works out, how, how close it monitors the cadence. And then... Um, is that, uh, the difference between the E 1.1 and the E 1.2 also the the front end, uh, I noticed there's like a, a basket thing. Is that also part of it or is that just a different build? Yes. So you do get the extra basket and you, uh, interestingly, the suspension fork comes on the lower price model. Hmm. Um, and I think that's because the, the rigid fork is designed to carry more weight especially with that, that front basket up there. So I think they oh, give yeah. you a rigid fork for that reason. Hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting, uh, interesting uh, dichotomy there. And the price is 1500 or $1,900. Um, the good thing is, though, you know, you go to REI, you get it, they, they put it together for you. You, you, you basically bike out of the thing versus, uh, you know, Rad Runner, where you would basically get a box and, you know, Rad Runner is building stores, but... Uh, there's only a, a few around and, uh, you know, their, their support is great, but, um, you know, you don't have that like hands-on type of thing, which is, you know, kind of the advantage of the Pedigos and the, the, the actual store kind of bike companies. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can't discount how important that is, especially for first time electric bike owners who don't have as much experience and, and want to make sure that they've got someone there for service or just, when they have questions or they need like a, a little tune up, even something simple like your brakes, you might have a harder time getting a, a local bike shop to help you if it's one of those sort of snobby bike shops that turns up their nose when you come in with electric bikes. So knowing that you have a, a service and support place there for your brand specifically is a, is a huge selling point. Yeah, for sure. All right. Uh, let's move on. Uh, how do you pronounce this? Trick? Trike? Uh, I think it's once trike. We Trike wants police patrolling cities on these hilarious, and they are hilarious, uh, 45 mile per hour uh, standing electric tricycles. I, I mean hilarious until you're probably going 45 miles per hour on one of these, and then it's probably scary as hell. Yeah, I mean, they, they do look fun. I'll, I'll give them that. So um, they are tricycles in a, they have three wheels sense, but they don't look like, you know, you're, your grandkids red tricycle kind of thing. So these are, no. uh, I think those are 12 inch wheels and they're standing trikes. So you're standing on this, um, oddly shaped three wheeled platform. It's like an a, a frame on the ground and you're in this, I don't even know what kind of stance you, you'd call that. It's not like a standing scooter. It's, it's almost like a segue stance, but you're not balancing. Yeah. I, I think of this as a, a segue, but you know, that goes really fast. Like, you yeah. know, and they also uh, lean. Like, right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so like, you, if you're you going fast, you can turns. like, exactly. You can lean hard into those turns. And that's one of their points is that like, you know, if you're, I guess, chasing down a perp or something, <laughs> and they make a hard turn, you can like lean in and, and really take it with them. And so yeah, you could probably I, chase I mean, down a, I guess uh, you could chase down a biker, you know, like uh, 45 miles per hour. Most bikes aren't, aren't going to be able to outrun you. Yeah. And they, um, I mean, they, they list some interesting advantages for police over like, let's say a, a bicycle, you know, you see a lot of bike cops or, or horse cops, I guess. And so I, I can see the argument here. For one thing, you're going to be a lot less tired if you're actually having to pursue somebody on a bicycle, even an e-bike, if it's like a class one, like when you're pedaling real hard, when you actually get to, you know, wherever, you, if you've chased down this perp or something, like you're going to be pretty tired. So if you can roll up on one of these three-wheeled scooter things, then you're not going to be huffing and puffing when it comes time to put cuffs on somebody. So 
I can actually see that and also hopping off, you know, it's not like a bike where you got to kind of like sling your leg over this. You literally just step off and you're on your feet running kind of thing. So I, I get wow, you can take them down. Escalators there are too. advantages. Yeah. They yeah, look like, uh... are, um... <laughs> it's, it's wild. It's so it's, it's, it's funny because one of the comments that I, I got a lot on this were people saying that I was giving these too hard of a time and like kind of making light of these vehicles. And there were a lot of people that were like, this is actually what I wish the police in my neighborhood had. And I, I kind of get it. I mean, I'd rather see cops out of cars and on these things, you know, because they're, they're more efficient, they're more approachable. Um, that's another point that they were making also is that, you know, if a big part of policing now is sort of integrating into communities and being approachable, right. then this is a lot easier to go up and like talk to an officer than, you know, knocking on a, a cruiser's window and being like, oh, officer. Yeah, for sure. Uh, it's it's interesting because this can kind of go like from mall cop to, you know, on the beat to, you know, this guy's flying around turns at 45 miles per hour. Uh, it can go kind of into different areas. So, you know, it, it takes the mall cop beat but it extends it into the, the bike cop beat and even like the low end of like what I would call a motorcycle cop area. So yeah, 45 miles an hour, that opens up some serious doors. I mean, if it's like one of those, I need backup, you could like, all right, I'm leaving. I'm on the way. <laughs> it, I, I'm sorry. Like it, it does seem a little mall copy to me, but like I can see where these are, are going to be a good thing. So I'm, I'm happy for them. I think, I think law enforcement would be better off for it, um, but it's still a little funny. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Uh, let, let's move on. Um, we are now at, oh, cool. So uh, I always like to see people with uh, Alibaba success stories. This guy bought a 6,000 watt, so six kilowatt, all wheel drive standing electric ATV on Alibaba. Here's what showed up. That's so this is pretty wild. This is like, um, I mean, the design is, I want to say it's unlike anything out there, but it's actually a copy of an existing standing ATV. There's a company called uh, Easy Raider or Easy Rider that they make these super high powered four wheeled sort of scooter ATV things, and, but they cost like between twelve to $20,000. So this is a Chinese knockoff that's a 6,000 watt version. And uh, this guy who uh, didn't want to use his, his real name in the article, so I've referred to him as Lester. Lester reached out and shared with me his journey of buying this thing after reading some of my awesomely weird Alibaba electric vehicle, The Week Stories. And so he found this thing. He was like, all right, I, I have to have this wild and crazy standing electric ATV in my life. So he spent about three months in the ordering process. He um, sent, I think it was about uh, 2000 bucks or so uh, for the uh, vehicle itself, plus another 1000 or so uh, in shipping to China. He picked out like the exact model he wanted. It was supposedly going to be sent over, and then he didn't hear from the factory for like a month. And he's like, all right, what's going on, guys? Like, I just paid you. What's up with the radio silence? And then all of a sudden, out of the blue, the shipper's like, dude, have you filed your paperwork? Like this thing's on the water. You got to file the paperwork or you're going to have huge fines when it arrives in the US. So he went online and found like a customs broker. He'd never imported anything like this before. So he had a customs broker get all his, uh, you know, dot his I's and cross his T's. And then the uh, standing ATV actually arrived in California. He rented a U-Haul, went and, and picked it up. Fortunately, he didn't have any like fines or fees or anything for filing late. Though that's you know one of the the risks of doing this yourself. Uh, loaded it into the U-Haul. The funny thing is he got one of these U-Haul uh, five by eight trailers, and he thought it would be fine because it's like a pretty big trailer. And the thing was like a half an inch smaller than the opening. If it had been mm. like a cold day, it might not have gotten in. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So he did uh, get it home. It was about uh, three to four months in this this process that it took from finding it on Alibaba to actually getting it into his driveway. But once he, you know, opened up the crate, got it all together, it was very little assembly. It's been working great for him. So the thing is ridiculously high powered. It's four wheel drive, full suspension. Uh, and he mostly uses it on road. It's, it's designed to be able to do on or off road. Uh, it seems like he's somewhere in sort of California suburbia, but he's looking forward to 
to riding some trails with it. But pretty much what he's been using it is sort of around the neighborhood, that sort of thing. I don't know how street legal it is, but I'm guessing that no one hassles him if he's not, you know, riding like a lunatic. But it's definitely a, a cool story to see that someone actually went through with purchasing one of these weird sort of out there Alibaba designs and, and actually had something neat show up in their driveway. Yeah. And I, the, the design, like you, you don't see much like this anywhere. It, it kind of reminds me of one of those um, old people scooters that, uh, you know, they, they kind of cruise around in and like, uh, you know, at a Walmart or something if, if uh, or whatever, but added huge wheels and, you know, absurd amounts of power. Like it would be fun to, like if that becomes a thing where, you know, people are just cruising around in their Walmart scooters, this would be a tricked out version of that, which yeah, <laughs> super depressing. But like, if that's the, the scene, then this would be kind of a cool, whatever. Uh, yeah, I could see it. Like if, um, you know, the apocalypse came and Mad Max could only find a mobility scooter and that's what right. you had to start with. <laughs> yeah. This is what you would have in the end. This would, this is what Mad Max at 88 years old would ride around <laughs> to Walmart <laughs> and, and post apocalyptic oh, Walmarts. Um, love it yeah uh i also like how big is the battery on this thing it looks pretty uh, big that's a good that's a good question yeah i'd have to go back to the uh original listing i think um i mean it's gotta be pretty huge probably a couple kilowatts yeah usually power. they they give you a few options um i know when i've talked to some of these vendors as if i was gonna buy they give you like a whole you know spec sheet full of different options so i'm guessing there's probably a couple kilowatt hours here at least yeah well, cool. I'm always happy to see these. And I'm like, you know, every time I read your uh, weekend weird Alibaba piece, I'm always like, I could probably, I would love to have one of those. Uh, just the, the shipping yeah. process is always the killer. Buzzkill. Yeah. Spoiler alert for everyone. Uh, I'm working on bringing a boat in. So Ooh, I'm hoping which... in the next... Uh, couple a uh, couple of months it's going to be it's actually one that i featured over a year ago it's taken me a while to pull the trigger but i think is i'm there, ready is, it's the uh is there is five it solar oh. uh it's not solar yet but it's got a uh like hard top on it that i'm gonna try and put some solar panels on so um i think it's gonna be pretty easy to do uh that sounds really interesting i can't wait to see that all right uh let's see we are at oh microlinio so kind of like we're we're right on the cusp of cars, but we're not going to call this a car because the the rear wheels are kind of one and the same there. Uh, Microlinio opens configurator for its adorable electric micro micro car to thirty thousand reservation holders. So quite a lot of people here. Yeah, there've been a lot of people in line for this little thing. Um, you know, we often call it like a a mini car, or a micro car, but the Microlino is actually. Uh, what's classified as a quadricycle. So it's not a uh, car, it's a different class of vehicle, like a, a motorcycle or an auto cycle. And so it doesn't conform to um, car safety standards, that sort of thing. It's, it's a little closer to motorcycle standards. And so it fits into this weird class. I think it's a L6E or L7E in Europe. We don't really have the same categories in the US, but uh, if you're on the other side of the pond, I think that's what it fits into. And so it's basically you know, serves the function of a very small car. It's a two-seater. It goes about uh, 55 miles an hour or about 90 kilometers per hour. And it gets a range of, depending on the battery pack, somewhere between like 50 to 100 miles, about like 80 to uh, 160 kilometers or so. It's got a sort of a BMW Isetta style to it where the, the door is actually the front end of the car, like the entire front opens like a like a can i guess and uh, you just walk out the front it's a bit bit trippy there in that way but it's yeah. it's really designed like a car like if you see the uh, chassis there it's got that unibody construction so you know it really looks like the way modern cars are built it's not a tubular frame which is actually what they started with for the prototypes and they've they've gone back and they've really sort of redesigned a a car like construction style that should make it as safe as as you could with something that's not designed to meet car crash test standards. But as a car alternative in cities, I could see this. I mean, it's enclosed, so you're not getting rained on. You can actually put 
groceries or other, you know, cargo in there without worrying about strapping things down or, or having them fall off. If you were in a, a fender bender type accident, you know, you're protected, not like on a scooter or motorcycle where it's like a knee bender accident. Right. So there's a, there's a lot of advantages here, you know, for, for an urban resident. I mean, it's, uh, I think that, that I'm very much in the, I don't want to say like anti-car, but I'm very pro car alternative camp. And right. um, I know Seth, you sort of got a foot in both camps here. Right, right. Uh, you know, for city driving, uh, actually for cities like New York, when I lived in New York, I, if somebody offered me a free car, I would have just said, no, don't want to, don't have any need for it. And it would be so expensive to park it in such a pain in the butt that I wouldn't even want it. Uh, up here in the suburbs, I try to bike as much as possible, uh, even shopping on bike. But, you know, when the kids need to go somewhere uh, kind of far away and it's raining or snowing, the bike can't really bike that. So uh, I try to bike when I can, walk when I can. But uh, this would be a great option uh, for kind of like that city person that needs to do, you know, some dry, like rainy city stuff or, you know, needs to do uh, lots of grocery shopping or needs to get out to the, the suburbs a little bit. So I, I like yeah. this car for, for the city. Yeah, and at 55 miles an hour, I mean, you could take some some faster roads that you wouldn't feel comfortable going on an electric bike or even like a, you know, small electric Vespa style scooter. Yeah, uh, 55, huh? I don't know. It kind of looks like if you stop too short, you would just start rolling like head over heels. <laughs> <laughs> it was very yeah, ball. I'm not going to be able to get that. I'm not going to be able to get that image out of my head now. <laughs> Uh, I maybe think they, it's probably got a pretty low center of gravity. Yeah, and you know, anti-lock brakes or something, hopefully. Um, but yeah, uh, and you know, with without the doors on the side, it probably is a little bit structurally uh, solid. So if you do get in a fender bender, uh, maybe that's a little bit stronger than you know it would initially appear if it had doors, like a smart car or something. Yeah, I mean, I think they're really you know pushing safety here because even though it doesn't need to conform to, um, you know, standard car crash test ratings and that sort of thing. It really seems like that for quadricycles, they, they've gone above and beyond with the design here so that it's as safe as you can get without all the extra expense and weight and everything that goes into meeting actual car requirements mm -hmm. for, for crash testing. Right. Where are these made? They're made in a, uh, I think it's Turin, Italy, a facility. Oh, okay. So they're, um, they're almost entirely European parts source. I think something like 80% of the parts come from Europe with most of them coming from, uh, in Italy there. It's, it's a Swiss okay. company, but they do the, um, all the assembly there in, in, uh, in Turin, I think. Okay. That's pretty cool. Well, uh, I don't think these will be on the roads in the U S anytime soon, but it'll be cool to see them out uh, around Europe. Yeah. I, um, I don't normally do car reviews but since this is not a car i'll throw my my hat in the ring for this one if there's a chance you think they'll be in israel um <clears throat> i don't know but I'll, I'll go wherever i need to to get in one of these things they look like too much fun yeah italy's not too far all right uh moving on let's talk about watercraft and i actually saw one of these at the ford f-150 uh in fact that might be from the this the lead picture might be from that but the f-150 lightning uh towing uh, had one of these uh, arc the most powerful electric watercraft arc one electric speedboat reveals price open sales yeah, do you think that could be you in the uh, f-150 there or did you not pull one i didn't pull that one but um somebody else was pulling it at the time i pulled a uh what do you call it the uh arrow streams ah okay so um so not seth in that one but uh i'm jealous you got to see that thing up close because it looks pretty interesting. This is like a, a super powerful electric boat. It's um, it's interesting because it goes 40 miles an hour. And so to get that kind of speed with an electric watercraft, you're pushing a lot of water out of the way. So there's sort of two ways to do it. You can either get out of the water like Candela does it by sort of flying above on hydrofoils, or you can just put like a ton of power in there. So they went with the second option and they've got uh, a 500 horsepower inboard motor so it's a uh, 370 or so kilowatts 
and that thing gets it flying. Now that does require a huge battery, which again, like you can either sort of go around the water or you can just like plow right through it. And so right. in the second route, they've got a massive battery. So 220 kilowatt hours, the boat is wow. basically designed around it. Yeah, so they went with a uh, aluminum hull instead of fiberglass. Part of the reasoning was that they basically had to build it to support the weight of such a, right. a massive battery pack. So um, it's, uh, I think, something like 3,000 pounds for that, that battery pack. It's, it's huge. I mean, even for like, you know, a, a truck or something, that would be big. But for a boat, and this is like a, a eight or, or 10 seat or something like that, uh, it's, it's a very big battery. So uh, the cool thing, though, is that this is not just like a concept. You know, it's not like that they've got um, a prototype, that sort of thing. They're actually, uh, you know, bringing this into production and they've started sales. It's priced at $300,000. So, you know, this is not going to be in every marina in the country. But if you've, if you've got the money to consider, you know, electric boat shopping, like boat money, then I guess this would probably be up your alley. Like this is not a, a cheap endeavor to get into even gas powered boats, boats, right? Like you got to have money for this. Yeah, and it's nice that it's uh, electric because it, you know, boats that are typically that powerful are really loud and annoying. And this one obviously wouldn't be that way because of the electric motor. Um, so you can kind of sneak in. I wonder if this, this would be a good uh, cop boat uh, because because of that sneaky factor. You know, like the, the nighttime drug bust raids from Miami Vice. <laughs> oh, that, that's interesting. I hadn't considered it for that. But yeah, that would be... Uh like black out and, and sneak up on them. That'd be pretty interesting. Yeah. Huh. yeah. The, um, the other thing that I've discovered as I've started covering more electric watercraft is there are a lot more lakes and, uh, canals in an area that only allow electric watercraft. And at first I thought this was like, you know, a, a very green sort of like uh, eco awareness thing. But in fact, there are a lot of areas that just, don't want to deal with the noise and the pollution, not even from like the green aspect, but like they just don't right. want it in their water. And so I think that's, that's great that there's starting to be so many more areas that are allowing only electric boats. And so uh, we're starting to see the market uh, come alive with these different options. There's still not very many of them, which kind of makes it easy to become the most powerful electric watercraft when you don't have a lot of competitors. But um, you know, if it has to start on the top like this and, and work its way down until we get more affordable electric uh, watercraft for the masses, then then I'm okay with that. That's kind of the Tesla model, right? That it started with the Roadster and right. eventually we got Model 3s. Yeah, and uh, it's, um, well, it's two observations there. Um, one is that um, the Candela model of just getting up on that hydro, you know, on, on the, the ski, I get, what do you call foils, that? The, yeah. the foils, the hydrofoils is so much more efficient like that seems like the future like it, why why aren't it, why isn't every boat like that um and the other thing is like on the on like there's a waterway near me it's actually it's uh called the croton uh, uh, croton reservoir um it's new york city's water supply so they don't want um gas motors on there but the cops for whatever reason have you know, a gas motor version or gas motor vehicle on there. But the rest of them, uh, the rest of the boats on the reservoir are, are just like rowboats because nobody's even probably considered that you could have an electric boat. Um, but some people have these like little trolling motors that have existed forever because um, they're like, I forget what they're called, like Minn Kota or something. Um, yeah. And they, and they, you know, they have like a car battery that, just sits there and they're like trolling motors uh for when you're like uh you know you're you're trolling behind you know you're fishing and you don't want to like scare the fish with a with a motor so there's all kinds of like routes to electrification in, in the boat scene and it, it's been around for a long time um but i think the future like if i look at this compared to a candela and i think about like do you really want um what is it three thousand pounds a battery? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 3,000. 3,000. Or, the, you know, the alternative is half the battery, half the horsepower, but the same speed on a foil. It's really not even a consideration. I, I yeah, what, are, what, I, what are some, like, advantages of not having a foil? 
So the foils, they do come with downsides. Um, the original C7 from Candela, the foil was in the water all the time. It didn't rise up out of it. So every few weeks, you'd have to sort of clean off the marine growth to keep it oh. efficient. Otherwise, you'd start um, you know, using more battery. And uh, yeah, you got to get those barnacles and stuff off. Their, their new C8 that they um, have in production now, the foil actually rises out of the water when... The boat's just you know resting in, in a dock so that's great because you don't have to you know clean it off anymore Interesting. Um, but it's also you know it's more complicated to design it requires serious software to do the computer controlled uh, stability i mean mm -hmm. this thing's making like you know hundreds of micro adjustments a second wow. so there's some significant complication that you've got to design in and i imagine the arc team has many fewer engineers than the candela team right yeah you're just kind of brute forcing at uh, the stuff um yeah that would be that'd be interesting if you could put a like how fast would this thing go if uh if it had a foil it'd be it'd be flying right oh man yeah uh, i think those two companies should team up because i'm not sure that arc's ready to get this thing going faster than 40. yeah all right well um that's it for the stories let me uh just burn through some of the the comments uh we don't really have too many and there's unfortunately we can't block LinkedIn and there's a bunch of advertising there. So boo, boo on that. All right. Uh, Bruce Doolin says, hi, Seth and Micah from Brisbane, Australia. How's it going? Uh, it's good to see people globally. Um, and speaking of that, hi, Micah and Seth. I don't even know how to pronounce your name because it's in Korean. I am from Seoul, Korea, and uh, they are one of the leading fat tire bikes. Okay. So that's advertising too. Um <laughs> John Miller. Story hey, Micah. Person. Yeah, it was good. Hey, Micah, I really enjoyed your reviews and have purchased several e-bikes based on them. I got bit by the e-bike and everything electric bug several years ago and and own more e-bikes than I care to admit. Yep, I'm nice. in that same, same realm. It's an affliction. Uh, let's see. Sen Tosh says, "Would be would you be interested in a government project for retrofitting?" All right, so we're getting pitched here. Um, why is there more opportunity to find and bring more revenue to feed the overpaid blue thugs? Oh, this is the the police. Uh, RT is not a police uh, fan. Um, let's defund those guys. Is kind of the idea, I guess. Um, and then Grandmaster UV is our last commenter saying, good show. Electric vehicles are awesome. And I want the Suron X Lite B, which I think everybody does. <laughs> it's an awesome trail bike. Yep. All right. Cool. So uh, thank you, everyone, for tuning in this week and uh, everyone who joined us in the comments there. And we will be back in another two weeks with all new news stories related to electric bikes and other electric personal mobility. So we'll see you guys then.